Welcome to the pop-up uh, exhibition series of the Magnus. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague Greg Meyer, director of the Center, Berkeley Center for New Media. Since it's a new media talk, I brought my laptop with me just to make sure that I'm prepared. And uh, Greg, for some reason, put my name there, but right? it's really uh, his uh, research and his insights, uh, as we were exploring together uh, some months ago, uh, aspects of the Magnus collection, insights on, on one Hanukkah land, and he prompted a lot of research that was eventually conducted by a team of scholars in this Berkeley around this map. So this is his side of, of the research on, on the map, on the materials and the materials of the memory. And, um, and uh, but we'll maybe also be a little bit in conversation to sort of uh, bridge the various aspects of the research that was really prompted by one object and is now expanding in a variety of directions. So please join in welcome Greg Newman. Well, thank you for coming, and uh, good to see you, and thanks, Francesca, for having me in this beautiful space, and for presenting the object of today's pop-up in this beautiful context. Uh, it's really, uh, it seems so much bigger once it's behind a display case. And first we, first we found it in your archives about three months ago, and it was, I think, in a little a cardboard box and wrapped up, and it didn't, didn't have the full uh, presence that it has now, um, because uh, at the time we didn't know so much about it, and in the past few months we were able to unfold the object, as it were, and understand more about it. And so I'm trying to share some of these things with you today. Um, I just come from teaching my last class, and my last class is a video course, uh, and, and my, in my last class one of my students walked up to me and said, well, you know, Professor Inar, I enjoyed your course, and uh, I, I, I just, there's one question I have is, I was in your course the whole semester and I really don't know how to post videos yet uh, to the course website where we review them. And, and um, I was sort of mystified, how could he sit in this class for an entire three months without realizing how to post a video? Because all the other students were doing this, that's what we were doing in this class. And he said, I said, oh, just use YouTube and then share the link. And he's like, YouTube? What is YouTube? I'm like, Okay, um, there's a bunch of things that you're missing here, and, and, you, and we know you're a computer science student. We know you. I know you know about this stuff, and, and, and I explained it to him, and and I suddenly realized that he had a very partial view of what was going on in the world around him, and maybe it's because he was really focusing on his studies. Maybe it's because of something else. Maybe it's because of some kind of disposition he has. But he was really not quite connecting with the, with what was happening in the course at all. And, and I said, but on the other hand, he's willing to ask the questions that will connect him. And this is a bit of a ridiculous example, but I recently got a haircut, as you can tell, uh, and my haircut has, uh, is, is Jewish, my, my, my barber is Jewish, and uh, I tell her about this pop-up, and she says, but what do you know about menorahs? You didn't grow up with menorahs, you don't have it in your blood. And I'm like, what, can you see this through my head as you're cutting my hair? And, and, and she said, yeah, I can just tell, you know, you didn't grow up this way. And uh, I said, you know, you're right, uh, but I do ask a lot of questions. And so, again, it's the partial view story that, that resonates with the student who really didn't know what was going on. And most of us, when we admit that we don't know what's going on, suddenly opportunities open up to find out. And the fascinating thing about materials and memory is that when we have objects like this menorah here, it is open to all questions. We can look at the object and we can ask it questions from every different angle. Uh, on the other hand, when we have a, a database and we ask a query, we can really only ask the questions that we already are aware of. And, and so um, that, that is a discrepancy between the kind of knowledge that is mediated through digital means, where it's always abstract, and the kind of knowledge that is mediated materially, when we can touch it and we ask one question, and it still is there, and it tells us things we didn't ask about. And so I think my student told me things, I told my student things he didn't really ask about. And my hairdresser told me things I didn't ask about. And this object told me many things I didn't ask about. And that is the fascinating uh, reason for collecting materials that, that keep asking us questions maybe from the past that we didn't ask about. So, why, why do we enjoy this process? I want to uh, start with a slide about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Um, 
when we ask a question and we get an answer, uh, sometimes uh, we, we get this reward. It's like, oh, I was right. I thought I got the right answer in multiple choice tests, for example. But there's another, um, and that is an extrinsic motivation because um, we get a reward for the right answer. And that's a very uh, particular way of thinking about the world and of learning. And uh, it starts in grade school when, when, when we um, have that situation where the teacher asks us a question and we, we say the right answer and the teacher says, good job, you, get, you, 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 you answered it correctly. And, and then we just go for the reward, the satisfaction of having done the right thing. And those, those kinds of rewards are called extrinsic rewards. They have to do with grades, with points, and things like that. And they have to do with uh, the, uh, the, the, an institution that tells us that there's a control structure that controls knowledge and says, if, it tells us if something is right or wrong. And there's a completely different uh, reward system which is called intrinsic motivation. In intrinsic motivation, it is not the external reward that drives me forward to do something. It is the uh, it's my internal state, my my wish, my internal wish that does that. And two uh, psychologists, uh, Ryan and Desi from uh, uh, Rochester University, uh, described uh, a theory that tries to understand better the differences between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. In 1971, they were writing about. Uh, when intrinsically motivated, a person is moved to act for the fun or challenge entailed rather than because of external pros, pressures, or rewards. And so, so fun is really important. In, and uh, later on, they elaborated on what fun really means, and uh, they understood the three uh, psychological needs that underlie fun. One of them is competence, the other one is autonomy, and the third one is uh, relatedness. And so things are fun when we connect with each other. Things are fun when we feel like we can do something. Yay, we don't fall off the bicycle. Or, um, or when, we, when, we, when we notice that we develop an autonomy, an agency, that we can go do something in the world, and, and we, we retrieve something about our identity that, that, that is impactful in the world. And uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the expanded version of fun, which is a really underrated concept, I think. Um, because it's not being taken seriously enough. But then it goes on, uh, and they found out that every extrinsic motivation, in fact, reduces our capacity to enjoy our intrinsic motivation. So if we take a student's curiosity and then translate that curiosity into a grading system, we actually get, make it harder for that student to experience their own sense of curiosity as a valid reason to do something. But that is fundamentally the most valid reason to When we take this forward, so this is uh, 30 years of research, maybe 40 years of research, they take this forward and they say um, that, that if we live a life of intrinsic motivation, we always are seeking for more information. and We always run into situations where we get more, more, more answers than we asked for, or where, where objects ask us more questions than we wanted to get into in the first place. And, um, and it's called mastering ambient challenges, where we become aware of new challenges, and those challenges uh, wake us up, and uh, those challenges lead us to new experiences, and those new experiences lead us to a sense of uh, uh, personal development, and uh, these personal developments, we integrate them into a coherent self. So, so the self that is always intrinsically motivated ends up being a coherent self, a self that puts itself together, a self that hangs together, rather than a self that is composed of multiple responses to extrinsic challenges, right? Um, and so, so that is a self that is, is much more grounded. Um, I think that is very important for uh, the understanding of uh, what kind of a community we have. Because this, the community that we live in is made up of a bunch of selves that are either intrinsically or extrinsically motivated. If we're all extrinsically motivated, then it's easy to control us because we're following certain cues and certain certain uh, 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 provocations and certain challenges, and we always go for the reward. We want to have better credit ratings, we want to have more money, we want to have you know, more of this, more of that. And we're really chasing something that is proposed to us from the outside. But there's a much deeper sense of community that comes from a group of people who gather together and uh, work on intrinsically uh, formulating themselves in their community. And the key vector to do that is information. 
when a community comes together, it comes together because people share information. For example, us right now, we're, we're a community that came together to honor uh, the pop-up uh, series and, uh, and to find out more about what's in the Magnus collection. And we're a, a community that is configured right now because of the fact that we're sharing information with, with each other. Right now it's mostly me talking, shortly we will have a more of an multi-way discussion. But, um, so we're forming a particular community because we share information. And we can visualize that. And so this yellow dot, I guess, represents somebody sharing information, such as myself or Francesca. Um, and then um, the connected dots there, they seem to be matching the number of people in the audience quite closely, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the, the connected dots there are you who are now receiving the information and thinking about it, perhaps, or, or at least uh, having an uh, opportunity to relate to it. And uh, we create a network of informed people. And then uh, another person, maybe our friend, is doing something else right now. And they're going uh, down a different path and forming a different community. And uh, these dynamics are, are, are what, if we repeat it, they ultimately form what we call a culture. And uh, so one of the challenges that we're looking at is right now we're doing this stuff in person, but one of the challenges, well, I guess there's one more step here before we get to the challenges. Um, if we go back here, we see that uh, the person in the middle, this person right here, um, is uh, uh, doing a special case, which is, that they're connecting uh, two sets of in, two sets of communities because they share information. Say, if you now go to your friend and say, "What did you do over lunch?" and they say, "Well, we did this," and you say, "We did that," then suddenly you're configuring what is called a structural hole in information theory, a hole between two sets of information circulation, right? Two systems that share information, and that structural hole um, is very powerful because that structural hole connects two communities and. Uh, can choose to share information from one community with another and thereby configure a third community that's larger. But it makes that person powerful. Um, next. So sometimes the I'm just gonna skip this one, but sometimes we enter a phase where Sharing of information is no longer done from person to person, but rather done mechanically. This is extremely tricky because we're no longer in charge of forming our communities ourselves, but we rely on machines, mechanical or electronic, to form communities for us. And we thereby pass the delegate the power of defining who knows and who doesn't know something to mechanized processes, to mechanical processes. Um, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how to bring this up uh, in this context in terms of the But um, when, we, when we collect information uh, and uh, mechanically and then share it mechanically, we abstract it and we store it. And once it's abstracted, it really can be controlled by very few people, but it may affect very many. Um, and I believe the uh, German census of 1933 counted how many Germans were in Germany and uh, what, what their uh, ethnic background was, whether they were Jewish or not. And this information was recorded in, in punch cards, Polaroid punch cards, and uh, was stored in a central information agency. I'm not sure which one. Francesca, do you remember what it was called exactly? The Volkszählung, right? The, German, the, the, the census. Yeah, uh, I, I, well, one of those very long, complicated German names. Yeah, and so, so, so as, as, as Hitler took power, he sees that record, that database, that census. And the one, uh, whether a person was Jewish or not, was a single bit in the, in the punch card. Right? The punch card had, I don't know, 128 bits, and one of them was Jewish, yes or no, true or false. And um, by the mechanics of the Hollerith machine, he, um, his staff was able to sort all Germans according to whether they were Jewish or not. So there was a complete database of who are Jews and who are non-Jews, and where they lived and what their names were. And that was the administrative foundation for, for the Holocaust. The, that data was available all in one place. The significant thing to me here is that the census of 1933 wasn't intended to be part of the Holocaust. That 
bit of information, Jewish or not Jewish, changed its meaning within three years radically, and it became a life or death question. And all of that happened in an abstract mechanical layer where people weren't in charge of their own information anymore, but machines were. Today, of course, we live in a world where this is much, much more dramatic, and the information that is available about us and not in our hands is far larger than one bit. And uh, so we have a lot, a lot of things to think about and, and uh, to take seriously. So, information is actionable by whom, to what end, upon whom. And um, as we know, uh, the uh, information that the Holroth machines collected, by the way, Holroth uh, changed its name after this incident, and uh, because they didn't want their brand to be associated with the Holocaust, and they changed their name from Holroth to IBM, International Business Machine. Um, okay, so um, anyways, uh, the result of the, uh, the, the census and the, re, the, the changing of the meaning of information um, led to um, separation of uh, into concentration camps and eventually um, uh, destruction of uh, uh, many lives and many, uh, many like great loss of human life, uh, many Jews, many uh, other people didn't fit the regime's uh, definition of what was right. Uh, and uh, the surviving remnant uh, was the group of people who survived the Holocaust and were freed in 1945. And uh, these um, people who were left in 1945, the surviving remnant, were collected in a displaced persons camp by the uh, Allied armies. And uh, there's a lot of history here that I'm only vaguely familiar with, so um, if you want to back me up or correct anything, that'd be great. So, two, two very quick uh, items of information. Yes, we will share the microphone. Yeah, we share the stage and the microphone. So, uh, two very bit, quick bits of information. One is that um, the Surviving Remnants was the name of one organization of survivors from Eastern Europe who were, had been displaced in Germany. So there were several organizations, there were several groups, and this was one of them, and that's sort of the, the leading one. And there were multiple uh, displaced person camps in Germany. There were millions of displaced people from all over Europe, including many uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jews. So this is a, a small group within a larger Jewish group, within a broader group of, of uh, displaced persons across Europe at the time. So that those are the and the and the, the Hebrew name of the organization was Sherit Apleta, which means more or less the remnants that's that's left, the, the remaining leftover, something like that. And it's a, it's a quotation from the Bible. They not they were yeah, yeah. Okay. And so I'm using the surviving remnant uh, in an expanded version here to say whoever survived were the surviving remnant. Right. Um, so well. The surviving remnants uh, gathered and went to different directions. They went, many of them went uh, to then Palestine, and many of them went to the United States. And, but it was hard to figure out uh, where to go, and uh, it was hard to just su survive. There was huge uh, malnutrition issues. There were uh, there was no clothing for the displaced persons, and uh, uh, to the displaced persons' great frustration, they often were given um, German military uniforms to wear. Um, instead of normal clothes, and they had to wear the very clothes of the people who have uh, oppressed them uh, long ago. Sorry. Yeah, I'm going to turn this off. And there were many, many stories like that. There. There were many stories about the difficulty of um, freeing people from uh, concentration camps and where to bring them and what to do with them. And one particularly damning report um, about the activities of the Allied forces uh, described how the concentration camp uh, era was not really over after the end of the war in the sense that the many people who were freed from concentration camps were kept in the concentration camp, the very same buildings under slightly different conditions without the extermination aspect, of course, but still not able to live a meaningful life and uh, put together what we call a coherent self. And so that brings us back to the intrinsic rewards. And so, so what people were doing at the time to uh, create a coherent self again 
was education and was uh, job training. That was one of the paths, one of the vectors, it seems to me, that helped people retrieve a sense of identity and a sense of autonomy in the world. And this exact object we have here comes from that context. It is a, um, a menorah that is made of stoneware. Stoneware is um, a kind of ceramic, and here I can go back, a kind of ceramic that, um, the clay that was uh, that was actually uh, abundantly present in Germany, and it also um, was fairly easy to use because you could press it into forms and make many different copies of it. It is kind of brittle. It it tends to be used. It tends to be used for for beer mugs, and uh, it's not very really refined. It's not porcelain. It's kind of rough, and uh, so it's a rough clay. It can be pressed into forms. It's it's readily available as a natural resource. And there's a glaze, a green glaze, that is also readily available in Germany at the time. Of course, many resources are, are destroyed, but this one material seems to be around still. And uh, so the, the, the quality of the stoneware is, is really quite pedestrian. So the typical thing you'd make out of it uh, was beer mugs and ashtrays and things like that. Um, but what happened, apparently in this, in this, this place, person camps that were uh, created in 40, 45 and were active till about 52, was it? Yes, early 50s. Early 50s. Um, was, was that people wanted to learn how to do something, and so this, this fairly uh, pedestrian method of making clay, this very vocational activity, w um, was, was one of the resources that were abundantly available. And so what did they do? They took this really simple technique and they created uh, one of the most important uh, religious artifacts that, that they could come up with at the time and they made their own menorahs out of the kind of clay that was used to make uh, ashtrays before. And I find this very moving. I find this to be um, a, a, a process of taking something very basic and, and raising it to a higher level of meaning. And um, you can see that, uh, well, well, I'll pass it. Actually, I actually do have an ashtray here like this. And I, 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 I found this um, because I was looking uh, where, where this material um, was used in other contexts. And I found it online, actually, at eBay. And uh, one of our, our colleagues, in, in a Jewish scholar from Germany, said, you know, these, these materials are still traded all the time. And so I, I went up to eBay uh, to, to find one of these, and, and I'll pass it around. Don't drop it because I'm about to donate it to the museum. But uh, but it's an interesting material, interesting reference, and. Uh, Why don't you pass it in the envelope? It's insulated. You can still touch it. You, you can touch I it. Understand that, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Whoever, you can touch it. Do you? You can touch it. I feel more comfortable. There, like that. Okay, good. Appreciate that. So, so you can see that this is a fairly rough technique, and it, it, it reproduces things. You can make uh, these plaster molds for it, and the plaster molds, they can be used about a thousand times before the mold is worn out. And, and the clay is really literally pressed into the mold, and then pulled out, released, and then fired. And you can press it from two sides, from the bottom to the top. And uh, this um, is an expansion of that technique because we have uh, at least uh, three molds here that are pressed separately and then brought together. So it's called a multi-mold system. And the interesting thing about um, the mold system is that, as you can see, that we have the same ashtray design here, but in this case it's, it's used to promote a swag, essentially, swag for a, uh, a car factory, a car, a car garage. And then here is another one, and here it advertises a bank. And so what they were able to do is simply switch out the central portion has the logo and make the multi-mode mold um, out of slightly different parts, with the base form being the same and the logo changing. And so there's a, there's a flexibility in this medium that you can fairly quickly change the purpose of an object simply by putting a different label on it. And um, in, this, in this one here, though, uh, in the menorah that we have here in display, um, there are three, three shapes at least. One is the trunk that is chopped off, one is the stump that remains, and the third is the base with the candles. And uh, let's look at that more closely. So is that laid by the, um, the survivors? 
That is made by displaced persons, yeah. And uh, so there's, there's actually, as I mentioned, the, the, the multi-volt situation. This is a picture of the object we have in the case. And then there's another version um, that looks like this. And there's an inscription here. It's exactly the same, except the inscription changed. And it appears that there are, uh, this is from a German collection uh, in Munich. And uh, there's a reference to it here. And um, I'll ask uh, Francesco to translate. Um, and uh, what they say in this catalog, this was exhibited in, uh, in Munich in the, uh, let's see, the museum here. Is that table? The Jewish Museum. The Jewish Museum in Munich, yeah. And, um, and it describes these objects as being rather ugly. Uh, it says, it says uh, these rather ugly objects, um, what can we say about them? And um, they're referring to two objects. One is a Seder plate, and the other one is a, uh, a Hanukkah uh, lamp. Uh, and they were produced in 1947. So they were produced within the DP camps, although it's not clear uh, who produced them. And it appears that um, there were multiple versions made, and the versions differ in interesting ways. And so, Francesco, help us um, read the inscription there. This says, Havaat Merkazi Pernunia. And has a date, so it's the, the the central committee in Munich, Germany, and the date is the date of uh, 1947. It's actually a Hebrew date that would correspond to the later part of 1947 and 1948, because the Hebrew calendar begins in, in the fall in September. Uh, but since this was made for Hanukkah, it's likely that it was December of 1947. This was. Uh, uh, and the TB is inscribed after a person who was uh, Taich, I can't remember his, his last name, who, who was, who was in, uh, in charge of that organization. So it was probably likely honoring him or celebrating his role. Or, yeah, it's possible that the, the people working on uh, learned how to be ceramicists um, were, were making a series just to honor uh, that particular man, and then made another series just to honor the, the uh, joint distribution board. And uh, so, so they switched out the logo, just like the ashtrays, to, to mm, honor different people, or to promote the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> value, the value of different people. And uh, that wasn't the artist's initials? Excuse me? That wasn't the artist's initials? No, no, there was not the artist's initials. And they're not signed. These are these are industrial products. They're not made by a person sitting and, and expressing themselves. They're they're made in a, a mass fabrication approach. Who made and the original mold? Because that's the artist, right? Who made their actually it's interesting that you see that curve there that's around? Yeah. The, that is probably from a completely different um, yeah. that's probably from a completely different decorative plate. So you could yeah. take you could cast it from you could copy a, a, an existing form and just mix and match it. So it's actually profoundly postmodern in that sense that you could take, and probably from another ashtray or another random object, uh, a shape and just copy it and put it, make it part of your mold. And of course, there is skill there, but there's also a lot of remixing going on. And there's the intention to 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 mass produce it. It's not the intention to to uh, mark the perspective of an individual artist. It's interesting. My grandmother is German. She was an artist. She lived in that period. And her initials are Teofilia Arnheim. And she did them exactly like that. Mm -hmm. With the T and the A. So I don't know. There's, a, there's another artist who did something similar. So I don't know the German way. No, no. We're going to tell you that there's a, the, the guy's name Albrecht Dürer, AD. And, and that's where it started. He put the A and the D together in that kind of fashion. And I think it's, it, it was a theme. It was a style, and, uh, and so uh, it's beautiful validation. Yes, that was the style at the time. But yes, this is not the artist. Um, any other uh, questions at this point? Yes. Um, kind of a morbid question, but if these uh, uh, workshops were set up in Kansa, talk about intrinsic or remote re-adaption, where the what's the system that was used to construct oven, the ovens and all that used to construct the kilns? How much of that? That that is a that is a that is a creepy question, and it, I have to admit that it crossed my mind as well. Um, as far as we know, that um, these these uh, 
uh, vocational schools and the, the, those activities were not uh, taking place in concentration camps. There was um, in, a, in a camp called Föhrenwald, which was, um, uh, we have a map of it, it was very, I, about 20 kilometers Yeah, yeah. It's all the way. It's all in the way. And uh, it, it was a, a, a camp, I believe, for. Uh, it was repurposed. It was. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll find out more about it exactly. But um, it was repurposed. It existed already, but it was not. It didn't have the. the those kilns were not previously used to incinerate uh, bodies. Um, on the other hand, the the mere fact that. I, when I imagine this working out in my mind, I imagine how, you know, in, in, in April of 1945, you know, German uh, soldiers or guards or whatever, members of the Nazi regime would, would extinguish their cigars in, in ashtrays, uh, and that very same um, material was then repurposed to celebrate something so holy and so beautiful as, as, a, as the Hanukkah uh, uh, of lamb. So, so the, the connection is there. The, the example you're mentioning is a little extreme, but the material connection from one one political regime to a completely different one, and, and from a oppression to liberation, and how the materials stay the same, that is profoundly uh, troubling and, and moving, that you could go from something really basic to something really beautiful. So. Well, also, how about the people who, who taught the courses? I mean, were the, is that the same thing with these Germans who were previously you know, I imagine that they, I imagine that somebody, probably from the from the joint uh, distribution or, or board, would would go and find the kilns and say, okay, we need these kilns now to to, to bring them to the, the DP camps so that the DP people can learn something uh, while they're figuring out what to do next with their life, which is very very meaningful. And they probably requisitioned a lot of these resources um, because they were in charge, right? But they. Probably some technician said, "Okay, let me show you how this works," and, and taught them. And maybe you know, a week earlier, they, they were doing something very different with the very same medium. And so that's exactly the, the reason why we're talking about media modulation. We're talking about how a a medium, a whole practice, can change its its it can the, the use of it can change entirely um, from from one time to another. And, uh, and so, for example, if you have a factory that makes buttons for, for political campaigns, you know, they probably make all the buttons in the same factory. They have one line for the Republican buttons and one line for the Democratic buttons. And the medium really doesn't care uh, what the message is that is being conveyed. And yet, um, so, so we can then look at the, the quality of a medium as, as to how many messages of different kinds of cultural contexts it can carry and convey. And so, so, so it's in one way the medium is agnostic, and in another way, um, there is a continuity that all of the, 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 that we want to explore a little bit more. You have something? Uh, okay. So the one the one comment is that the Fernwald was a uh, was a was an industrial complex established before World War II, and during World War II, uh, the people who worked there were slave laborers. Uh, under the Nazi regime. And then it was used to house uh, displaced persons and have a, a greater concentration of, of uh, Jewish DP, DP, displaced persons. Uh, so it has its own story. It was one of the largest DP camps in, in, uh, in Germany. And that history is, is well documented. One thing that I find fascinating, and I, I want to hear what you, what, what you say about this, is um, no matter how much we actually research this, and we, have, we were able to identify three different molds, three different printing of this object with different inscriptions. The one from the map is in joint, the one that you just showed uh, with the inscription for both the, the, the organization and the, and the initials of the, of the person who is honored, possibly. And then the and, same one without the initials. And then another one without the initials, so just for the organization. So different ones. and, and uh, this one is in the, in the collection of Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, the other one is in a private collection, and the one with the joint inscription is at the map. So those were the ones where, but no, we're still uncertain about the conditions under which these, uh, these objects were created and the purpose, and was it for a specific ceremonial? Was it uh, they were presented on a specific occasion? We, we really don't know too much about all this, which is in itself very fascinating. 
So we do know, though, where what the provenance of this piece is. Yes. And uh, should we get back to that in a minute? Yeah, whenever. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We will follow up. Okay. So it's, we have about whoa, seven minutes left. So I just wanted to point out that the fundamental thing that moves me about the situation. Where's the ashtray now? Oh, oh good. So, so in the ashtray, we have the vector of usage. The vector of usage is that you take your, and this is clearly for cigars, you take your cigar, you rest it here, and then eventually extinguish it. So the vector is it's going down, right? Definitely going down. And um, in, the, in the menorah, we have the vector going up because there's candles and there's light. I mean, the candles over time burn down, but the light radiates. And, and one of the concepts is that the, the light is not supposed to be used for any practical purpose. You're supposed to use it only for spiritual purposes, correct? And, and so uh, to be looked at, to be gazed at, to be reflected upon. And what I find particularly moving is that the, the one branch that is sticking out of the uh, stump that is still alive that is where the shamash candle is, the one that you use to light all the other candles. And that's the one candle that has a practical purpose. And I find the, so the vector of the, of the shamash and the branch going up is completely different from the vector of the ashtray and pushing things down. And I find that very beautiful. I also find it beautiful that the, the functional candle, as it were, is the one of the branch that is growing. And so it's about the light giving and the, and the, and the I guess also life giving function and it's very, very compelling. So if we look at the, the quote, um, uh, the, the Sherry Tablet um, quote, it shows up in the Bible in at least three places that Francesco and I were able to identify. And to me, the, the least fitting one, um, perhaps uh, technically, but the most fitting one spiritually is the remnant that has escaped uh, uh, of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit. Upwards, so the vectors then go both ways. So we have bearing fruit upward and taking root downward. You need both, and and I think that uh, perhaps the, the the thought I want to end on is that this idea of, of reappropriating a medium that was used potentially as part of the aesthetic of oppression to uh, reappropriate that and say, no, this is now our medium for our, our, our expressing our religious values and for educating ourselves and 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 for, for really configuring our future selves and like our coherent future selves that we are so intrinsically motivated to achieve. Um, that is the big reversal that, that, that is so compelling, that we can go from oppression to liberation and we find our autonomy and our agency in that act of reappropriation. And so, so there's certain media that make that, that allow for that and certain media don't really allow for that. Language is much more complex because um, but the recycling doesn't work as smoothly because you can't quite get rid of it, what it did before. Um, but, um, but material media like this one it seems to be that yes, we can redefine what it means and we can uh, find our autonomy in, in that act of redefining it. So I'd like to end there and uh, uh, then I want to say that this has a particular provenance that maybe we should add that to Yes, yes. Um, just to add to, to the history of the object, this uh, Ampana was donated to the Magnus by Rabbi Zelen of San Francisco, who had served in the U.S. Army as a chaplain during at the very end of World War II. So he was serving as a chaplain in Niki camp. So I, the likelihood is that he collected that amount while on duty and in, con in conjunction with the work in Niki camps and with, uh, with survivors. And then he was he was he. Was, became a rabbi in San Francisco, he was a rabbi in San Francisco for many years, and he brought them out with them to San Francisco and eventually donated it to the Magnus in Berkeley. So there's also a collecting history that comes with this. We uh, exhibited along with it a replica made by the Joint History, the American Joint Distribution Committee of a cedar plate that was produced in the same context. One of the things that are fascinating about it is that comparing it with the other lamps, they likely got the color wrong in making the replica. Probably they didn't have access to other color images like we have now over the internet or uh, to, the, to the original items themselves to, to make the replica. And uh, so that's, that's a fascinating um, aspect of, of, the, of, this, uh, of this additional object. This is a, a, a sailor plate that says, uh, next year we will be free. Of course, it's, it's about freedom 
and, 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 uh, and, uh, and the idea of Passover as, as a holiday of liberation. Thank you so much, Gregory Meyer, for participating in our pop-up series and concluding the series for the fall. And your talk was, among other things, a proof of concept. Um, we did not, I mean, we did not say that you are a Jewish studies scholar because you're not. <laughs> you are a scholar of media, and, and, and you focus on the medium. And as part of the research we've done in a working group here at the Magnus, all kinds of other elements of, around the, these objects emerged. So it's been, again, a fascinating collaboration and multidisciplinary look at the collection of the Magnus and it's in all of its possible manifestations. Thank you again very much. As, as a presenter in this, uh, in this series, you uh, received you received a copy oh, yes. a, of the Jewish World. Thank you. Uh, our catalog. Is this the there? It is not. Well, we have, <laughs> have to make a new edition of the, of the catalog. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, maybe there's some questions. We have to discuss them some more. Yes, Greg. Uh, there was a, a bunch of questions come to mind, but I was really curious about the whole idea about uh, intrinsic motivation. Um, you as a teacher, a little bit uh, off the mark here, but why is all teaching done on that basis? I'm trying to get people in, uh, intrinsically motivated, but it seems to me that's the way, only way. Why wouldn't you do that? It should be like that. It's um, part of the extrinsic motivation comes from the fact that we want to communicate how motivated people were uh, in an abstract form. So we give people grades or points. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, uh, it's kind of like the, the wise man points to the moon and the fool looks at the finger. It's like the, the, the grade itself is the wrong thing to look at. Right? And, and so we take the, the, the symbol for the meaning, which is wrong. And uh, what we really want to do is uh, cultivate more intrinsic uh, education opportunities. We don't do enough of that. And I'm sure that the, the people who worked on these, the feeling they had when they saw their own hands having made this kind of thing, must have been profoundly intrinsically motivating because it, it, nobody gave them a grade for making that thing, but they knew that they were reconstitu reconstituting, reconfiguring their own culture. And that is a profound moment of autonomy. Oops. And also capability, right? I can do this. I can make my own. That's amazing, right? They had nothing. And they made this thing. So, uh, but yes, I think education shortchanges uh, students if uh, extrinsic motivation is overly uh, uh, emphasized. Uh, also, from the idea of lifelong learning, it, to be intrinsically motivated is definitely the way to go. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I can only confirm. That. Any other questions? But there's much work to implement this. Yeah. I very much agree that, uh, and I hope this was clear, they probably made this for their own use primarily. But then, since you could make so many of it, they were like, oh, let's make a few more to celebrate, to, to promote the joint uh, distribution committee and the, those kinds of things, right? Um, and I, I don't, this one doesn't show any marks of usage, does it? Yeah. So, but the, but the idea, I think, is yes, we make, we reconfigure our own culture. And, and that's, that's of survival importance, right? People who could do that probably had a much better chance of dealing with uh, uh, adversity than people who couldn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just have a comment. I, I've never heard anyone call it a Hanukkah lamp. I've always called it a Menorah or a Hanukkah. 
Yes. Oh, so I'm going, the, the German catalog call, calls it a Hanukkah lamp, and that, that's where I, I know what you mean. But, um, uh, and, and then, yeah, what, what about that? Well, there, there are various theories about this. One is that actually the, the term Hanukkah, which translates into English as a Hanukkah lamp, uh, is, is a new Hebrew word. It's, it's, uh, it's an Israeli Hebrew word. Uh, traditionally, it was called the menorah for Hanukkah. So there are different ways to call it, and they kind of maybe transfer different ideologies around language and the home itself. All right, let's go with menorah for the most part. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah? Yeah. Menorah has less places for the Menorah is typically seven branches. So this is this is menorah, but menorah means lamp. And then there's candelabra. Yeah. And the is a menorah is the Hebrew word for lamp. And candelabra so, is all lamp. Right? So Hanukkah menorah or Hanukkah lamp is the same thing, depending on whether you want to use the word menorah or the word lamp. Uh, but menorah is used in, in, in colloquial English to indicate a seven branch candelabra comes from the Temple of Jerusalem and then used also. Let's just celebrate. Now, one object brings up many questions that we didn't plan to ask. Okay, thank you, thank so you much. again. Very, very much.